Good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining our Zoom meeting. Before we start our program today, please allow me to share the protocols of video conference. First, please kindly adjust your name or ID screen using the format your name underscore your university abbreviation. Second, during the video conference, we kindly ask all participants to turn off the audio and only turn on the audio when MC and moderator give the suggestion. Third, we would like to recommend all participants to adjust the seat position comfortably and prevent the backlight effect. Fourth, please ensure your network has a stable internet connection for your convenience during the event. Fifth, we recommend all participants use a headset or earphones for clear and better sound. In addition, we kindly ask all participants to fill in the online attendance through in tip.in slash online presence form P2P, or the link could also be found in the chat room. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start the program. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning and evening to all of you. I would like to welcome you all to the virtual public lecture people to people relationship program with the topic interdisciplinary applications of geographic information system or GIS in this beautiful Saturday, October 17, 2020. Having a goal of strengthening higher education in Indonesia, the education and cultural attaché of the Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C., USA, Majelis Rektor Perguruan Tinggi Negeri Indonesia and I4 US and Canada initiated a collaboration with the big theme People to People Relationship Program. This year begins with the virtual public lectures or VBL and later will be expanded to activities such as joint courses, joint research, joint student discussion, joint syllabus and others. The implementation of PPL is divided into several clusters. From a total of 17 clusters, ITS became the coordinator of two fields, namely engineering and architecture, urban planning and design. Here we are participating in VPL series of P2P program for architecture, urban planning and design. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, please allow me to greet Professor Popi Rufaida, Indonesia's Educational and Cultural Attaché for USA, or the representative. Professor Taifu Mahmud, Managing Director of I4 for the US and Canada, or the representative. Dr. Andy Ilham Muhammad, Executive Secretary of Majelis Rektor Perguruan Tinggi Negeri Indonesia, MRPTNI, or the representative. Assistant Professor Dr. Dian Mustikasari from Drake University, USA, our speaker today in virtual public lecture, People to People Relationship Program. Hi, Bu Dian. Hello, Ibu. Waalaikumsalam. So it is already 8 or 9 p.m. there. We are really thankful for your kind effort to be with us today. I like that. <laughs> All the representatives of USA Canada Diaspora, Ibu Dr. Ira Mutiara Anjasmara, our moderator today. Hello, Bu Ira. Yeah, good morning. Selamat pagi. Good morning. Thank you, Ibu. Also, warm hello to all lecturers and students as participants of virtual public lecture, People to People Relationship Program. In this beautiful day, we are going to have the following agenda. First, the opening of program. Second, the public lecture along with the question and answer session. And then a wording session followed by closing. Ladies and gentlemen, before going to the main events, let us lower our heads and pray to the Almighty God, hoping that today's event will be smooth, beneficial, and fruitful for all of us. Praying begins. Praying ends. Please allow me to remind all participants to fill in the online attendance through intik.in slash online presence form P2P, or the link would also be found in the chat room. We will send the material today to the registered email addresses. 
Now, I would like to introduce our moderator today, Associate Professor Dr. Ira Mutiara Anjasmara is lecturer in Geomatics Engineering Department, ITS Surabaya. She completed her doctoral and master degrees from Curtin University, Australia. Her experiences varies from surface deformation monitoring using geodetic techniques, land gravity survey and ge geo ID modeling and many others. She is currently the head of study program for graduate and postgraduate in Geomatics Engineering Department at ITS. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ira. Ya, yeah. uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, and a very good morning for all of you. And thank you, Mbak Yani, for a nice uh, introduction. Yeah. So, uh, for today, I will uh, guide the public lecture uh, for uh, this morning. And before we we start our public lecture, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker today. So uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Dianostika Sari. Yeah, uh, selamat pagi, Bu Dian. Uh, she is an, an assistant professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Sustainability at Drake University in the USA. Uh, and she earned a doctoral degree in the field of uh, urban planning and public policy from the University of Texas Arlington. And also uh, her master uh, was earned from the same university yeah, uh, in the field of city regional planning. And she also has a bachelor degree in architecture uh, from Universitas Indonesia uh, in Indonesia. And yeah, uh, in terms of uh, research, uh, she has several studies sponsored by the Texas Department of Transportation, West Michigan, and uh, and also from Cancer Research UK and North Central Texas Council of Governments. And currently, her ongoing research is the application of Geographic Information System, or GIS, with the involvement of River Banks community with a study case in Jakarta and Des Moines. IOA, uh, sponsored by Nelson Institute. And uh, if I read uh, her publications and also uh, uh, experience in research, actually it's very long, very long uh, publications and experience uh, in her field. Yeah, so I think we just start the public lecture, so Bu, Bu Dian. Uh, are you going to share your screen? Ya, yeah. terima kasih uh, Dr. Ira. Uh, selamat pagi semuanya. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, sebentar saya share dulu. Um. Oke. Okay. Uh, semuanya sudah lihat slide-nya? Sudah, Ibu. Yes, sudah. Uh, ya, terima Sudah, kasih. Uh, Ibu sebenarnya telah uh, salah, apa namanya, uh, share screen-nya. Ini di main screen-nya sepertinya, Bu. Oh, sorry. Saya share uh, ini note ya. Oke. Okay. Okay. Bagaimana sekarang? Sudah bagus, Ibu. Sudah nampak di kami. Ya, yes, uh, pertama terima kasih uh, atas kesempatan uh, kali ini untuk bisa bicara dengan uh, semua di uh, Indonesia ya. Saya ragu bilang Surabaya karena dengan Zoom kita bisa lintas <laughs> daerah. Um, uh, dan terima kasih untuk yang uh, pihak ITS yang mengorganisi acara ini segala macam and um, uh, dan uh, kesempatan untuk jadi lecture di PT. To pay seri ini. Um, pertama, uh, saya mau ada beberapa tujuan saya dalam uh, untuk lecture ini. Um, dan mohon maaf sebelumnya, uh, saya belum pernah lecture dalam bahasa Indonesia <laughs> karena sejak uh, you know, sejak dapat um, doktorat degree langsung di uh, di sini. 
Um, jadi mungkin lecture-nya bakal akan dalam bahasa Inggris dan mungkin gado-gado sedikit. Um, yeah. tujuan, tujuan lecture saya kali ini adalah pertama untuk uh, pertama sharing pengalaman, right? Sharing pengalaman bagaimana uh, perjalanan akademi saya dari arsitektur menuju urban planning dan sekarang bagaimana saya ada di Departemen Environmental Science uh, dan Sustainability. Um, kedua, sharing pengalaman uh, saya bekerja sama dengan orang dari berbagai disiplin. Saya beker, pernah uh, bekerja sama dengan orang dari civil engineering, uh, public health, uh, computer science, uh, sekarang dari ekologi dan segala macam. Dan semua itu memberikan uh, insight ya untuk uh, dalam menghadapi uh, approach ke masalah yang kita uh, harap. Uh, harap mendapatkan solusi melalui research. Um, dan uh, ketiga adalah uh, tujuan saya adalah mau bicara tentang uh, you know aplikasi GIS dan bagaimana saya menggunakan GIS dalam uh, berbagai research tersebut. Um, pertama, uh, you know, saya mau cerita sedikit uh, inspirasi saya uh, untuk uh, untuk melanjutkan studi um, almarhum dokter insinyur Ferianti Haidir Ing adalah salah satu fakulti di Universitas Indonesia yang saya ingat pernah bicara bahwa you know tidak semua um, mahasiswa arsitektur um, yang lulus dari sini akan menjadi arsitek um, tapi yang paling penting adalah kita uh, dididik untuk analytical thinking, untuk solving problems. Um, dan itu adalah salah satu life skill yang sangat penting untuk uh, you know, uh, masa depan kita. Um, terus, uh, uh, Profesor Dr. Gunawan Cahyono yang uh, saat itu dekan, um, dekan di UI, uh, waktu saya ambil studi di sana, uh, you know, sangat memfokuskan pada um, the importance of observing lived experiences, right? Uh, pada pada saat itu mungkin termaterialisasi dari vernacular arsitektur, uh, vernacular itu lahir dan melekat pada mereka yang tertindas um, sebagai, um, you know, uh, sebagai uh, hasil dari interaksi. Uh, interactions between people and others within the spaces that they are in. Um, during architecture training, and I like to say training because, you know, we are trained to do that, uh, to work in the field of architecture. Um, you know, there are so many influential concepts that I learn. Uh, not early on, you know, you're still kind of confused in a lot of ways, but later on, as you progress to the study, um, I, I was really influenced by um, deconstruction, the thinking behind or the philosophy behind deconstruction, uh, thinking about objects or matter as something that you can challenge, um, can deconstruct, um, and be made into something else, something new, attach another meaning to it. Uh, and then um, I also was influenced by um, Christopher Alexander pattern language that looks into uh, just how there is this um, quality without a name that we can always find in our everyday life. Um, you know, the big events and the small events. Uh, quality of uh, without a name is like um, watching the sunset from the top of a mountain, right? Uh, when you attach uh, beauty to that experience, it, it limits the meaning behind it. So there's this quality of without a name that is, that is just uh, have so many things attached to that. Um, that is the purpose of kind of like how we engage with others and design and things like that. Um, another thing that is also influenced, uh, influential for me was uh, when I read Alan Jacobs, Great Streets. Overall reading all of these books uh, influenced me, right? Um, and I always, I, I remember thinking that, oh, I wish I, 
I knew this concept or I knew the theory behind this when I earlier on in my study. Uh, so I didn't feel as lost as before. Um, so Great Street was something that is very uh, important to me. That's when I started thinking about public spaces um, because um, streets, when you are on the street, uh, at least from my experience in uh, living in Jakarta, um, street is kind of a transient place, right? It's often not the place that you want to go there. Um, but you are just have to be there to wait for uh, public transit to, to meet people, you know, kind of like in, but you are engaging with others in streets. Um, so in the final semester of my architecture study, I, I opted, it was an option to write a thesis. So I wrote a thesis on public street um, with a case study of Malioboro, of course, the great public, the great street in Indonesia. Um, and then that kind of opened up this um, new inquiries in my uh, study, right? Um, being trained from um, being an architect in architecture uh, that engage with space and interaction of people in, in space into this broader context of um, people and people in public spaces and kind of all the overall built environment. Um, so I knew that when I wanted, uh, would I, if even if I had an opportunity to pursue, uh, you know, kind of a more advanced degree, I decided that I was, I love learning architecture, but I wanted to learn more about people. Um, and after graduation, I did practice for six years in the field of architecture and design overall. Uh, but when the opportunity came, then I decided to pursue a, a, gradu a graduate program in Master in City Regional Planning. And now I want to talk a little bit about how I engage with tools, um, mainly visual communication tools. If you are an architecture student, you are kind of, you know, expected to be able to use, I guess, coloring pencils or even, you know, renderings um, and to, as a tool to communicate the, what the space can look like. Um, you know, AutoCAD is one of the tools that I learned um, and 3D, Studio Fizz was later on that I learned much more at the workplace um, visualization. And we can spend, you know, one thing I want to say about these tools is that we can spend so much time, so much money and invest and, and become an expert in using these tools, right? Um, and just, you know, I have a friend who has a PhD in GIS and geographic information system, um, but my PhD is not that. Um, or we can use these tools to solve problems, to communicate something. Um, so now in, uh, then I, when I pursued the city and regional planning um, uh, degree, uh, I have to, I had to learn GIS. It's one of the required course. Um, so that's another set of tools that went into, you know, kind of my skill set. So um, initially, you know, it was, you know, just kind of an introduction. Um, what is GIS or geographic information system? Um, to me now, um, a lot of GIS has two sides. It, it has one of this kind of knowledge system, right? Um, thinking spatially that, get, uh, uh, that ask us to think spatially about, uh, issues and problems. Um, the second one is a tool to, um, you know, maybe answer questions that we have about our world experience. Um, now, um, GIS involves, right, um, the interaction between user, um, the software and tools and the database, um, to produce an abstraction or simplification of a real world. Um, 
we are the users making sense of the world around us. More so, we are the users producing information um, to be part of the knowledge that is made, uh, that is needed to make decisions, right? And this is uh, something that is very important in public policy. Um, it just went on. Uh, so um, here we have the users and GIS for those of you who are, you know, already familiar with the system. Uh, it represents information in uh, one layer uh, put on top of another and uh, to produce this integrated picture or image of uh, what we want to show, what we want to represent in the real world. To me, I have used um, GIS largely as a tool for answering questions, as a tool to communicate visually. Um, so I, I'm, you know, my GIS projects are probably nowhere as advanced as uh, Dr. Ira. Um, uh, and, you know, and different disciplines uses GIS as a tool in different ways also. Um, and there's also, um, you know, different um, approaches behind the methods that we use GIS and how we apply that um, in our discipline. So my, um, so largely I, 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 you know, I start with basic GIS knowledge uh, skill set. And then whenever I need it to answer my questions, I have to learn more and more. And, you know, and um, you probably have heard that, you know, technology changes so, so fast and that you have to always keep up with technology. And that's also true. Um, from when I started learning the GI ArcGIS from Esri, the company that produces it, um, it has evolved so much from, um, I was involved in a project to develop a land use modeling tool. Um, and it was a very innovative project thinking that, you know, a lot of um, urban planners or city officials uh, can have access or relatively access to GIS, um, but they, they need uh, a more advanced analysis to understand future projections. Um, so um, now S3 has made those tools available in its own packages that you can just kind of plug in a number and run them on your own. But when we did it, we had to kind of like really develop the model to implement that. Um, so one of my earlier work or, you know, part of my dissertation work was um, thinking about the idea of um, social access or justice um, re specifically related to transportation. So here is another discipline that went into, um, you know, my career, I guess, academic career. Um, I specifically remember that when I was trying to decide on you know, what topic do I want to study for dissertation? I asked um, a, a professor in Indonesia, a friend of mine, um, you know, what should I do? And, you know, what, what are the things that uh, are important and things like that? And um, I was told that, you know, if you are studying architecture, then it is typically preferable for you to continue advance in a, you know, a study, a graduate program of architecture and then PhD in architecture. So that's typically what is desirable. Um, in the US, um, it is a little bit less, uh, oh, sorry, a little bit less rigid and a little bit more flexible because um, when I went into city and regional planning, there is a lot of students who have different backgrounds from um, you know um, nonprofits organization or NGOs, uh, from industrial engineering, from uh, business background. So we all were trained to be this urban planning uh, in the discipline. Um, and then I started to think about 
uh, transportation and how it relates to our my lived experience, uh, really drawing from my own lived experience, um, relying so much on public transportation in Jakarta, right? Uh, hanging on to the door on the uh, on the bus in in rush hour when I was you know practicing uh, you know as a professional, um, and. And then I come to live in Arlington, Texas, in the university to study in the University of Texas, um, which is a suburb, which is kind of a small satellite city, uh, which is not walkable. It is also the largest <laughs> in the US without public transit. Um, so very contrast to my experience in Jakarta. Um, where walking, you know, it's not necessarily always walkable, but walking is a necessity. Uh, it can be pleasure sometime, but uh, different, you know, uh, in different places. Um, so I started thinking about my interaction with the space around me and my access, because to me, um, transportation is such uh, an important part of our life, right? It is the ability for us to carry our body through space, right? If we don't have access to transportation um, that we want, uh, some of my participants in my research says it's it feels like a disability, like I'm somehow it's my it's time. Um, so then I started exploring that in my dissertation um, and thinking about how to capture lived experiences, how to make lived experiences matter, right? That we have on this one hand, um, people going about their daily life, and on the other hand, from the government perspective or from the urban planning perspective, you have this bird eye view of how people should behave. Um, we plan for the transportation infrastructure and things like that. Um, and so from that project, it kind of like trickled into another project where I was able to work with one of the community that I had my study in um, and to develop meaningful research for them where we did a participatory mapping process of asking them, you know, where do you go? Which are the busiest streets? Which are the dangerous places? And we ended up getting $1 million to um, build sidewalks for neighborhood improvements in that neighborhood. So that was when I really started feeling like, um, you know, that what I do that um, my research could be meaningful for people. So it's not just meaningful for me, but also meaningful for communities. And I really, really fell in love with uh, this idea of community engagement um, as part of the research framework. Um, and so uh, overall, if, you know, if I were to be asked what was my overall read, uh, you know, what, uh, what is my overall integrated focus of my research, although they are very interdisciplinary, uh, I would say it's a healthy, livable communities, right? And one of the ways is that thinking about urban planning as um, that thing that defines public space and then uh, affects public health where people are engaging in these spaces, but then also kind of like in local, we also work to influence policy change to, uh, to get this healthy livable community. So when I started then working at Vice University in Houston, uh, I was really focused on inclusive transportation access where we focus on pedestrian, people on bicycle and public transit user safety issues. Okay. And, um, we look at analysis of pedestrian bicyclist related crashes. So here in the United States, um, the police always you know, report when there's a crash happening and then they go into a database in the state and then you're able to find out you know, where this crash happened. What happened. Um, and then thinking about how does they 
most risk, um, who are the most vulnerable people to be, uh, you know, to to be endangered by the safety issues. Uh, and the purpose is really to think about ways that we can um, develop research to complement this official crash data, um, to inform them how to better plan for the communities. Um, so we did a near miss study where we basically asked people to report like a whole week of what they, you know we call travel diary um, and tell us you know if um, if you ever had an encounter say if you were biking and you almost get hit by a car uh, and then what happened and and this also comes up my um, from my postdoc research where we think about capturing this incidents using smartphone app and being able to show them spatially um, and uh, be able to quantify the experience right um, so that people can see oh that this is really not safe where you know where the area is concentrated really um, and then um, and then we we also once we did that there was a lot of um, attention towards that because um, Houston, Texas was a big, big city, uh, very sprawling. Um, in fact, you know, it's, that's also a characteristic of Dallas, Texas, um, um, Texas overall. Uh, when I go to Indonesia and go to Garut, where I'm from, and people ask me, so what is the U.S. like? And I will tell them lots of roads and lots of cars. And that is generally kind of a description of Texas. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on the different community that was um, really experiencing this high risk uh, pedestrians and um, bicycle crashes. Uh, I, we work in a community in, uh, for example, in Gulfton, and maybe I can pull up um, the result here, where um, our study basically then um, became an indicator for neighborhood safety. Um, so we were able to kind of identify areas where, um, you know, people have reported uh, feeling not safe, problem areas, and attached with a survey. Um, and another thing that we did was really thinking about sidewalk conditions or, you know, this is just one of the measures that we did and using um, questions that we can then map spatially um, to see sidewalk conditions and um, also integrated into this uh, website from the Kinder Institute where I work before coming to Drake and thinking about, you know, like these are the questions we ask and be able to use this as a part of, um, um, you know, a decision making for city officials uh, to see where where they can focus their money at when they want to build sidewalks, for example. Um, and so we did that for two neighborhoods. Sorry, let me close that. Um, and then. And I, it is important to note also that in doing this research, we did a heavy community engagement process where um, this takes a lot of people capturing data. And so we work with a lot of volunteers and residents to, to um, collect this. And this is very meaningful in many ways, right? Um, because uh, we get much richer information from people that live in the neighborhood, in the community. And, um, and then we see them taking ownership of this information. Uh, and we see uh, very many, many uh, residents and you know, who live, people who live there come to um, city meetings and say, we want more money for our neighborhoods. We want, uh, you know, more sidewalks. We want more, um, you know, more investment in kind of making sure that our kids can walk safely to school. Um, and, you know, 
in the US, this is a possible structure. I don't really know how it is exactly works in Indonesia, which would be interesting if there was this ability for communities to raise issues this way. And really one of the most important part of this research was really giving, um, right, using GIS, using uh, our expertise, uh, what we know, what we can uh, do, we can show on uh, a map using GIS um, and give that to the community to be able to say, you know, this is the data that was collected for us and we collected that, you know, and make a case for uh, improvements in their life. Um, and so really one of the main purpose was to kind of give this platform and highlight this community. And I want to say again, maybe um, this is a very high, um, very dense, you know, highly, there were, there are 30 languages spoken at least in the homes of this uh, neighborhood. So you can see people from all over the world in that, that comes to Houston. Uh, likely first come to this neighborhood first before they then they can make their life better and maybe move out to a better place. Um, but as a result of that, we have also communities who are very uh, involved uh, in their neighborhood, like in Indonesia, you know, like where my parents live in Jakarta, where people talk to each other. And this is um, you know, and this isn't always the case for different communities in the U.S. because there's, you know, individualism is very high. Um, but there are communities like this where they are very heavily involved in uh, making their uh, uh, quality of life better. And so, um, and, you know, those tools we did, we really didn't use uh, data collection that was um, developed by ArcGIS. Um, mainly because we really wanted to reach out to people. So we were thinking about the questions, right? What can we show spatially, you know, using that geographic information system knowledge um, and ask communities, even though if it's through paper, um, and then make it into something, something meaningful and meaningful information. Now uh, in, in Drake, I've just started to kind of like, um, um, I guess, trying to replicate the same research um, using Survey123, which is an app-based uh, tool for data collection in ArcGIS, where um, you would, you know, I think what we designed here, this is Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, um, where you would be able to draw a line between the different segment and attach information to it. Um, and to me, this is what makes uh, GIS applications very powerful. Whether you are working with uh, street data or maybe a point data, you know, showing location where things are, or uh, whether you're working with terrain, um, you know, kind of like the surface of the earth, um, elevation and things like that, uh, you can all, you can attach different information to it and make it more richer, um, you know, um, and more meaningful. So that is probably one of the most powerful tool that um, our applications of GIS that I've been really um, involved in. Uh, as you can see, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of the GIS skill set that needs to run this, it's not it's not, you know, kind of the modeling process of it. It's very, it's not, you know, it, it requires some, um, some work beyond the basic, but um, once you set it up, it's, it's, uh, it should be user friendly. Um, and so that's how I mainly use GIS in, th in this kind of different discipline applications is to kind of um, serve as a tool to answer the questions that we're involved in um, and use it to really highlight information that are important that can be, uh, I guess the terminology would be crowdsource, right? To, uh, that can be gathered from um, maybe, you know, people who live in that area 
and present that and translate that into the next thing, into information that can be useful for the uh, you know government agency to make decisions about uh, investment, about money that can go into different neighborhoods. Um, another project that I I kind of like that is very interdisciplinary that I've been involved in uh, is uh, Project Hatch. And this project came out of a call really from um, a transportation um, kind of a committee that I answered to where they asked for um, different, um, you know, people from different discipline to address issues related to cancer. Uh, this is sponsored by Cancer Research UK, but the there was a three-day workshop that um, we were invited to, you know, fully paid, all you have to do is show up uh, and really think about projects, developing innovative projects that can address uh, lowering cancer risk or solving health issues related to cancer. Um, and my contribution really in, in this project is um, using my, I guess, my training in architecture and urban planning uh, to think about our relationship with the built environment and how does that affect people's health. And we and kind of like as a team, we developed this project uh, to, to think about women after childbirth. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like it's an urban planning, but the main uh, principal investigator is uh, uh, Caitlin Notley from University of East Anglia in uh, UK. Um, and, you know, thinking about this very specific important part of a woman's life where women are often kind of you know face these challenges changes uh, of experiences and having to take care of so many other things um, that often forget to take care of themselves right and that kind of like does that stress and thing contributes to cancer risk um, so we it was really uh, rewarding projects in a way that I get to to work with people from public health, um, from computer science, and you know, kind of psychology, and kind of thinking uh, uh, to address these specific problems. Um, and this is also a problem that you know, as a family, as someone who has a family, that I also experience. So I was also drawing from my own experience, and. Um, and that goes into how I take this into a different approach in kind of sustainability, right? When we're thinking about sustainability, um, you know, when I moved to Drake University uh, from environmental science and sustainability in, to work in the environmental science and sustainability department, they really wanted to have someone who can teach GIS. Um, you know, which is something I can do because uh, I use it always in all aspects of my research. Um, but I also wanted to uh, someone who can um, think about sustainability in the larger context, not just from the natural environmental protection. Um, and there was a hurricane, Hurricane Harvey, um, that uh, reach Houston, Texas when I was living there um, that kind of um, informed this particular line of research for me that I'm going to talk next, um, which is kind of within this uh, umbrella of urban developments and community resilience. So Hurricane Harvey was really, really, really devastating. Um, as you can see, this is an image taken from highways, people stranded in car. And at the same time, I was also expecting, <laughs> expecting another family member. And, um, you know, maybe it was the stress of the watching the hurricanes or kind of like watching the news. But uh, the baby came in the morning at the same day of uh, the hurricane hit. Um, so it was, it was, it was that experience that you know, kind of uh, trying to navigate through to through the city to get to the hospital um, in the middle of this flooding that uh, 
reignites my um, attention to flooding issues, especially in terms of kind of uh, the context of urban developments. And, um, and this issue is also something that is very dear and near to my heart because up until now where my father and you know my parents live in Jakarta, they still experience flooding. Um, so it is something that I have experienced firsthand, but I've also experienced this resilience, right, from the community, uh, at least from what I see from where my parents live. And I know that it also probably applies to all other communities in Indonesia and here too, when they are hit by extreme climate events, such as hurricane and flooding, that they are all so resilient, you know, and um, although it's not the same resilience. There are communities that can um, get back to their life um, right after, or maybe some takes longer, but uh, there's always a way for people to kind of, you know, they have to get back to their life. Um, so this is, um, this is something then that I explored when there is this uh, call for grant uh, from the Nelson Institute about uh, you know research in pressing global issues. Um, one of my colleagues here is uh, a, a, a professor who is trained in ecology, uh, you know, mostly water um, hydro ecology, and um, so and and have worked a lot in 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 Des Moines. And flooding is also something that was um, experienced by many communities in um, in the region, in this region where uh, we are now, a um, couple of years back, where a lot of places and businesses were submerged in water uh, because of a lot of hurricanes coming in. So um, being in the environmental science and sustainability department has really um, immersed me into this discussion of climate change um, and you know we have this different disciplines uh, other than urban planning who kind of like looks at so many different things um, who has been focusing on the issues of climate change um, more specifically and so for this uh, for this project we um, we work with also another uh, professor who is um, in the environmental economics um, discipline and to answer questions about, you know, how do communities interact with nearby, nearby waterways and how can we value the ecosystem of the built and natural environment where they live. Um, so we, so this is kind of like a diagram, a fan diagram that we, we show where, you know, we, we want to have this for objective um, and thinking about, you know, assessing the ways and ex uh, potential future community-based strategies and um, be able to quantify the values of streams and in urban communities and also develop a model from community engagement. And we have this number kind of like guessing where it falls within our own discipline. Um, and, you know, and so, we decided to do a case study between um, Des Moines and uh, Jakarta, um, partly because you know that's uh, this. This is an opportunity for us to bring our students to this different community. So we work with also with uh, Dr. Eka Permanasari from uh, Universitas Pembangunan Jawa in Jakarta who has been involved in a lot of projects also in Jakarta. Um, and so we're, you know, kind of like thinking about developing a joint studio workshop where uh, we would be able to bring students from Des Moines, from Drake to Jakarta for, uh, you know, kind of the joint workshop and case study. Here is where, you know, our case study in Des Moines, this is Four Mile Creek. Um, and as you, see, you can see, there's a lot of uh, community resources here, uh, high schools um, and things like that and parks. And um, I do want to show maybe a little bit of video and see if that will play. Um, 
just kind of what the flooding looks like in Jakarta. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do an ad. Um, so I don't know if you can hear my, um, now it's very, you know, all the elections result. So I don't think you can hear the sound, but it's just music. So um, maybe a little bit faster. All right, so as you can see that, you know, there are a lot of homes around this area that was also submerged. So that was our case study where we plan to have the case study in um, in Des Moines. And um, here is uh, an area in Jakarta, East Jakarta, um, that we were planning to have our case study in, um, which is kind of on the Chipinang stream, part of the Chipinang stream. And there were a couple of, you know, kind of choices why we choose a case study. We, we do have to think about you know, justifying this. Uh, one, because um, both my uh, PIs, uh, principal and co-PIs, uh, and I basically grew up in this area. Um, so we do have intimate knowledge of the area. We know people who have, you know, become community leaders in the area. So if we do want to work with residents on um, maybe thinking about spatial data, developing spatial data, um, and other types of data, it would be easier to talk to people. Um, and then there's a lot of, you know, like in, in, in many places in Jakarta, there's a lot of uh, very dense resources, community resources, uh, Puskesmas, um, you know, uh, middle school, SMP, uh, Kantor Lura, Lura, um, so, you know, we, we just wanted this to be kind of this small, too small case study that we can focus on. Um, and we are, the reason is that we think these questions that we are looking to answer can be applied to basically any streams in the world. So if we have a partner in Houston, Texas, for example, we would be able to apply what we learned from this project um, to uh, streams in Houston, or maybe you know, place other places in Indonesia and uh, other places in the world. Um, and so, Drake University is a small, what we call here, liberal university. It's a private university that really focuses on student hands-on experience. And so this project is really, uh, I guess it's a good fit for students to be involved in because then they get to get out there in the field and collect data and talk to people, not during, you know, COVID, but, um, you know, when it's safe, hopefully we were able to, to pick that up again. So this is where um, the stage of the research is at. In the future, I think um, how GIS can be a very important tool in this project is by thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the ways that we can show locations of things that people value most, um, or maybe locations where, um, you know, people's property are heavily flooded or consistently flooded. Um, so then uh, maybe, the community or even kind of the local government can think about, 
you know, what do we need to do to solve this problem in a way that, uh, you know, is informed by um, the data that is collected by residents. Um, and so, yeah, and be able to kind of, you know, use, use show the locations of these places can be something that will be, uh, can be very powerful. Um, so that's pretty much what I have moving forward. Um, I guess right now I just have questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Ibu Dian. Uh, some say that your voice is too soft. So, yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't look at the chat. And so um, I'm sorry about that. I have to make sure I kind of uh, maybe closer to the mic. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, yeah, it's very interesting uh, uh, presentations. Yeah, so I just take a note here that, uh, yeah, like it or not, uh, now we need to work in like interdisciplinary uh, point of view. Yeah, we need to work with uh, other disciplines to, uh, in terms to make our research more like community. Uh, yeah, uh, it's more meaningful for communities. And also, uh, I I really liked uh, that uh, most of in your research uh, there are community engagement. Yeah, which is uh, sometimes in Indonesia it's. Uh, Sometimes it's really uh, not not too easy to to make the community engage in our research or something like that. Okay, so now uh, is the time for a question and answer session uh, or maybe discussion. Maybe some of you would like to uh, share something in here. So yeah, let's see if there are any questions for you in the chat box. There is. I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah, there's one uh, yeah, from uh, Sylvia Agustina from UNSIA, uh, Aceh. Uh, thanks for the info about ArcGIS 1, 2, 3. Uh, this is new for me and sounds uh, exciting. So I, it's also new for me because I think uh, the last time I used GIS like, uh, like more than five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, her question is in, in Indonesia. Apakah tools ini bisa mengurangi proses digitasi? input data atau sinkronisasi data secara signifikan. Apakah ada tool semacam yang tersedia dari akses software, di open access software? Yeah. Ya, Would you like pertanyaannya. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sylvia, um, ya yeah, itu pertanyaan yang bagus sekali. Um, um, RQS 1-2-3 itu uh, app um, kalau Uh, pakai Android ke Play Store bisa di klik app-nya tapi untuk benar-benar uh, bisa menggunakannya perlu uh, akses ke ArcGIS Online uh, jadi kalau misalnya di kampus punya akses ke ArcGIS Online um, di sini kita semua harus bayar lebih untuk dapat <laughs> semua feature um, tidak ada pilihan uh, salah satu kendala ya uh, ASRI berkembang begitu pesat Uh, mereka juga bu buat uang lebih banyak. Um, so um, yes, ini salah satu uh, yang sedang dieksplor sekarang karena uh, dengan ma mahasiswa yang saya kerja sama saya di, di Drake, um, kita mencoba me melakukan koleksi data, uh, you know, karena pergi ke neighborhood terus jalan pakai survei one two three dan um, Tool ini sebenarnya bisa misalnya kita uh, menggambar line atau polygon, right, area yang mau kita uh, jawab pertanyaan, mau kita attach information ke situ, um, dan um, bisa langsung muncul di map. Jadi bisa mengurangi proses digitasi um, dan sinkronisasi data kalau Wi-Fi-nya bagus. I think there is a feature that you can kind of... Um, Use it to be offline. Uh, we didn't. We haven't really tried that because Wi-Fi here is, you know, very somewhat reliable cell phone. Um, one thing that you know we are trying to see, yang kita kita sedang lihat hasilnya adalah apakah lainnya kalau kita koleksi dengan handphone lebih uh, lurus atau enggak ya? Ini kan jadi termasuk pada. Uh, 
proses you know input dari orang yang menggambarnya um, kalau misalnya hanya menjawab pertanyaan soal point misalnya mau naro lokasi oh lokasi banjir di sini terus ada pertanyaan gitu kan ke situ mungkin ini lebih bisa uh, lebih bisa ter reliable ya input lokasinya tapi uh, perlu diingat untuk segala macam GIS or satellite mungkin Bu Ira juga bisa mengkonfirmasi um, lokasi data lokasi selalu tidak akan selalu pas di situ kan dia selalu mengcapture tergantung dari satelitnya Um, tapi ya harapannya ini bisa mengurangi data secara uh, sinkronisasi data secara signifikan, jadi mengurangi back back prosesnya. Um, QGIS ada punya uh, sema, uh, tool data tool collection. I think it's Q field for GIS. Uh, I don't remember the actually, but it's Q field something like that. And yeah, it's Q field and that's Uh, from QGIS, so that is open access. You can try, it may not have all the same feature, but it can answer simple questions, you know, and still very useful too, I think. Um, terima kasih, Bu Dian. Sama-sama. Ya, yeah, terima kasih, Bu Dian. Ya, yeah, yeah, because it's uh, for QGIS, because it's uh, free, ya. Yeah? Uh, sometimes the the power is not uh, as powerful as our GIS. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I open uh, direct questions. Uh, if you like to ask Bu Dian, you can raise hand and you can uh, deliver your question directly. Yeah. Uh, Jalu Rafi Ismail. Yeah. Uh, please. Uh, You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Is it okay if I'm not turn on my camera or should I? It's okay. Okay. Uh, going to my question. Uh, good morning. I'm Jalu from UPI Bandung. Uh, Dr. Dian, you conducted research regarding to the safety of pedestrians. I cannot justify that this kind of research would have better and longer term benefits in Texas rather than Bandung or Jakarta. But given the fact that urban transport and land use planning or maybe concentration of traffic jam there in Texas is more better plan or structure rather, rather than densely populated Bandung here or Jakarta, what are things you consider as challenges to conduct such research in Bandung or Jakarta? Or do you think that existing better urban planning is the primary aspect that would provide safeness toward pedestrians? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jalu. Um, that's a very good question, and I mean, it's something that I've been asking myself. Um, you know, I think first we need, uh, what I always try to remember is that uh, for every research, we want to think about um, what is there for now, right? What is there first? What is the base information that we can collect? And then we can kind of process it in more analysis uh, later and kind of get more information. So I think even just capturing, you know, asking questions about, oh, um, if you were waiting for uh, OJEK or for uh, a bus in, in Jakarta or Surabaya, um, you know, did, did you see, an, uh, like, did you see something where pe people almost get hit or, Um, was there any places where you felt you didn't, you were not safe? And safety is not just, uh, you know, feeling threatened by cars or drivers, but also where maybe crime issues is a problem, right? Um, so that's, those information, even just being able to identify those problem areas. And I think it would be really interesting also because we, it's so much more dense than here, you are right. Um, so if you have so much more people participating and giving all this information, you can kind of start to think about, you know, the concentration and a little bit much better, maybe. Um, so I think just even kind of asking a simple question could be very useful. Um, yeah, and then see what comes out of that. Um, Bu Ira, maaf, sepertinya di chat ada satu lagi pertanyaan. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a question from uh, Pak Numan. Pak Numan, uh, 
would you like to deliver your question directly to Budian or Pak Numan? Pak Numan, yeah, maybe I just uh, read the, the questions, yeah. Assalamualaikum Budian, salam kenal. Ya. Yeah. Bagaimana? Halo. Oh, langsung ya Bu. Pak Numan. Ya, yeah. yeah, terima kasih. Terima kasih Bu Ira. <coughs> Jadi ini apa? Terima kasih Bu Dian. Jadi ini hanya ingin mungkin Ibu Dian ada pengalaman menyangkut dengan bagaimana melakukan pemodelan-pemodelan dari database database yang sudah ada misalnya mungkin ada pengalamannya Ibu Dian yang bisa dibagi ke kami bagaimana melakukan pemodelan-pemodelan dari sekian database yang ada misalnya dalam merancang suatu daerah yang bebas banjir atau misalnya merancang suatu daerah yang bebas dari bencana. Seperti itu, Bu Dian. Terima kasih. Ya, yeah, terima kasih. Um, so, um, di sini um, data itu sudah jadi bagian integrasi dari pihak uh, pemerintah ya. Um, you know, kebanyak data, meskipun masih perlu juga banyak data, tapi data seperti uh, flood map, um, atau official and things, terus uh, route, street network, itu sudah lumayan uh, advanced di sini. Mungkin challenge di Indonesia adalah mencari data-data seperti itu dari mana, gitu kan. Dan itu adalah salah satu, mungkin salah satu challenge saya juga uh, untuk research di Indonesia. Kenapa saya sebagai seorang uh, student, ya, uh, hesitant untuk uh, research di Indonesia, uh, meskipun saya ingin karena data limitation itu. Um, so, da, untuk model, um, ada beberapa model, tipe model yang saya pernah terlibat. Satu adalah model yang uh, mungkin kalau menjelaskan, kalau di GIS sendiri kan ada workflow ya. Model yang bisa membuat uh, analisis itu otomatis. Um, so automated workflow modeling um, dan untuk merancang uh, jalur you know, best route uh, RQIS punya alat itu uh, tapi untuk me, 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 menggunakan alat itu juga perlu street network yang bagus uh, network data set so um, untuk di US itu Itu sesuatu yang banyak, sudah banyak dilakukan. Saya kurang tahu di Indonesia bagaimana. Um, tapi mungkin ada saya uh, untuk memulai dari awal belum pernah punya pengalaman seperti itu. Um, tapi bisa kalau eh, mungkin lebih ke uh, jawabannya adalah it can be done. Uh, it can be done if you have the right data base. base. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Budian. Yeah, that's that's the problem in Indonesia. Sometimes the maybe the data is there, but how to access the data is sometimes the problem. Yeah. Uh, is there any more questions? You can uh, raise hand and uh, ask directly to directly to Ibudian. Okay, there's one question uh, from uh, Siti Nurdini Nopianti. Ibu Siti, uh, would you like to uh, ask the question directly to Budian? No, yeah, if not, uh, yeah, I will uh, read the questions. Assalamualaikum Budian, saya mau bertanya, apakah terdapat website lain selain Inagio Portal untuk mengakses data SHP yang lebih lengkap, seperti terdapat uh, semua skala di suatu daerah? Ya. Yeah. Yeah, saya, uh, yeah, Ibu Dian, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe uh, I don't know whether you know about uh, Inagio Portal or not. Yeah, so Inagio Portal is basically like a, a database uh, managed by BIG, but, uh, BIG, Badan uh, Informasi Geospasial in Indonesia. So uh, they provide uh, like uh, data in form of uh, SHP, yeah, dalam bentuk SHP, and also uh, a map, uh, yeah. So I don't know whether Budian will answer this question or uh, not. Uh, maybe maybe your <laughs> 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 yeah. 
maybe your experience in the uh, in the US uh, how to uh, is there any like uh, like inagio portal so like a, a government portal that uh, provide uh, yeah like database for the whole US um so in uh, in the government system in the US there um, you know other than the city there is also the regional government where uh, a lot of cities in you know one region say in Jakarta uh, volunteer to uh, kind of make decisions together that can you know best fit the you know the best interest of the region um, so the regional government here is also given by the federal government money to uh, to build things um, and so they are the data clearing house here in the database system. But I also know that, um, you know, a lot of Department of Natural Resources, um, kind of wildlife department, also keep their own data, um, you know, and share it to the public. Uh, NASA has great data, Census has data. So we have lot, these lots of organizations and agencies that actually, uh, invest a lot of money in getting data, right? Because uh, public policy is supposed to be based on data, not just, you know, what you want, <laughs> right? Um, you know, what, uh, you know, or who want, who is the loudest voice? Um, sometimes, yes, but uh, it, in theory, it's supposed to be based on kind of this analysis and data. Um, so, um, I, I hope that, you know, I haven't really looked into it. I hope that in Indonesia, there would be some agency that would, uh, you know, then kind of talk about the importance of making this data public. I know transportation planner in Jakarta who do modeling um, for the Jakarta region, but the data is not public, right? Um, my, I know people who also have worked with the governments and work using GIS, you know, have all this, you know, lots of data that has been collected, uh, but those are also very limited. Only people who work in this project could have access to data. So I think this speak, this question speak more to kind of this importance of, um, you know, sharing data, having platforms to for us to all engage in data right if we want our students uh, our professors to be um, you know very cutting edge edge doing you know very advanced research then we need investment in so then students can work with this type of data and develop their own analysis and, you know, kind of like develop their critical thinking using this analysis and given, be given those opportunities. Um, so that, I mean, that question probably speaks to that very important needs to um, really think about investing in, um, you know, kind of data collection and being able to share the data publicly. Okay, thank you, Vidya. Yeah. There's uh, also a policy in Indonesia that, uh, uh, especially if the data from each agency was uh, taken using like uh, uh, people money uh, from tax, uh, the data should be open to public. Yeah, that's, that's actually that's a policy. Policy, but how to do that? Sometimes uh, it's not run smoothly. Yeah, not all, all all people know how to access the data. That's, that's still a problem. Yeah. So the uh, then yeah. Uh, here, uh, if you use tax dollar, you you have to make the data public. Actually, here you can make a public request. I don't know if there is a procedure for that. So there's you know more effort to get the data, but you can, and by law you have to. So I'm sure it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a question as well in the chat box uh, from Ihsan Rao. Uh, Ihsan, if you if you are here, maybe you can uh, deliver your question directly to Budia. Ihsan? No? So, uh, yeah. So, Assalamualaikum, Budia. Mohon pencerahan apakah RGIS dapat memodelkan lapisan tanah dalam bentuk 3D? Saya lagi studi tentang uh, land subsidence. Um, terus terang, saya baru betul-betul uh, 
menggunakan 3D feature di ArcGIS uh, tahun ini. <laughs> um, you know, di sebelumnya ArcGIS bisa menampilkan density, right density, and kind of like just diagram. Tapi uh, mereka sekarang udah punya feature yang bisa me 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 melihatkan substance uh, land topography and things like that. Um, so mungkin dari kampusnya kalau ada akses ke ArcGIS online atau my S3 ke organization uh, ada S3 training catalog yang bisa kasih data set you know untuk dites untuk so jadi bisa di apply pakai data sendiri um, dan bisa diikuti uh, step by step pakai data set dari mereka um, ada dan ada beberapa training yang sebenarnya free for the public too Um, yang uh, cuma perlu uh, you know free free S3 uh, user oke uh. oke okay. okay. yeah uh, yeah actually if your university has like an agreement with uh, S3 they can also provide a free a training ya yeah. like uh, like IT in ITS we also have agreement with uh, S3 But yeah, like Bu Dian said before, that because uh, S3 is like a profit uh, organization right now, uh, this uh, they have limitation as well for uh, in agreement. Okay, uh, next question is from Fitriana. Fitriana, are you here? If you are here, uh, jadi sepertinya semuanya mau dibacakan saja. Yeah. Uh, From Fitriana, Assalamualaikum Budian dari pengalaman ibu di uh, di Amerika. Teknik perencanaan seperti apa yang dapat diterapkan di Indonesia, khususnya untuk mengatasi permasalahan kota yang sangat padat seperti di Jakarta. Yeah, maybe it's related to your uh, research, ya Budian. You also uh, have research in Jakarta. Um, mungkin untuk menjawab pertanyaan ini harus agak-agak step back, ya. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of step back to talk about how. Uh, I learned urban planning in uh, University of Texas. So um, maybe different university would have different approaches, um, but overall in the US, there is an association that have the accreditation requirements for what you know every student in urban planning needs to learn um, to be able to graduate and get a master degree. So, um, There are many different streams where you can study urban planning, at, at least from my experience. And I don't know about, you know, kind of Europe or things like that. But in US, um, there's much more flexibility, I think, um, where when you enter, you get all the required course and then you can kind of go to different concentration. Um, so you can concentrate on urban design. You can work on kind of the economic part of community development, or you can concentrate on maybe just transportation and even within transportation, you can do modeling, you know, just more the technical aspect, or you can also do uh, community organizing. Um, and you, you also can focus on environmental and sustainability. I think a lot of university now has that in the US. Um, so to answer this question, I think it needs to be Uh, what needs to be asked is what problem, right? Uh, CD problem is what uh, uh, scholars have called as wicked problem. Uh, wicked problem because it's not a mathematical problem. It's a problem that, again, very interdisciplinary, um, involves social science, involves people, involves, uh, you know, different aspects of people's life. So, um, so it's just, you know, it's just, um, you know, there are different ways on how you can solve uh, planning problems in Jakarta or overall in Indonesia. And you know also that, you know, the city of Jakarta is very different than Surabaya. Is Jakarta different than West Jakarta? Um, And you know, and different isle, you know, different cities in different island also have different set of problems. Maybe cities that are next to um, kind of the uh, 
the conservation forest in Borneo has their own sets of problems, right? So um, it really depends on what kind of problems um, that you want to solve. Um, to me, I, I, I'm really passionate about engaging communities uh, because of, you know, they are the ones who live through this problem and they have the knowledge, the local knowledge that is important for professionals or practitioners like us or academias like us to be considered in kind of making our analysis. So we are not just like some expert, oh, I know everything and I come into this place and I'm gonna solve all your problem, um, put what I learned from here in the US and then kind of like just slap it on, you know, kind of the solution for Jakarta or in Indonesia. And, um, you know, maybe in some cases there are problems that can be addressed like that. But in my experience at, at the level that I, I'm interested in working in, it's always very, very heavily contextualized, very based on context. Yeah, yeah thank you, Budian. Uh, yeah, I open the questions. If you have any question, you can raise them. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question from uh, Bu Oyin, yeah. Bu Dian, apakah tantangan melakukan bekerja sama dengan para ahli dari berbagai disiplin ilmu? Hal ini masih jarang bahkan uh, di universiti. Yeah, that's my question as well actually. I'm going to ask uh, that question. <laughs> Banyak. <laughs> well, um, tantangan utama um, adalah kadang-kadang uh, kalau kita meeting seperti bicara beda bahasa meskipun semua bicara dalam bahasa Inggris. Right? Um, dan itu mungkin juga lebih muncul karena uh, ada beberapa disiplin yang sangat spesifik dalam you know jargon atau dalam training seperti ekonomi mungkin atau engineering. Um, jadi kadang uh, pengalaman saya yang uh, pertama kali beberapa you know awal-awal kerja interdisciplinary kerja sama students and professor dari civil engineering. Um, dan kadang-kadang kita meeting bisa sejam, dua jam, and I always feel like we're already talking about that. Why are we coming back again, right? Because everybody has to like be on the same page on you know what is the most important part that we uh, we want to solve. Um, so yeah, it sometimes it feels like it's a different language, and sometimes uh, you know different terminology from different discipline is applied or is being used but when i look at what the meaning is oh it's 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 called this in you know in indonesia uh, in in uh, in urban planning so it's like uh, you know bahasa sunda sama bahasa jawa terus <laughs> oh uh, apa bicara apa tapi oh ternyata maknanya sama atau mungkin ternyata kita tujuannya sama cuman approach-nya beda um, approach juga metodologi uh, you know atau metodologi yang diprioritaskan uh, juga beda um, ada yang you know kuantitas, quantity, quanti, uh, quantitative dan qualitative, right? Uh, engineering, uh, environmental science is very quantitative. Um, urban planning can be quantitative, but also very qualitative. You can also be uh, doing things mixed method. Um, so really, you know, um, to me, uh, I was trained in a way that the method that I use to answer questions should be based on the question, right? Uh, it shouldn't be, well, you know, the correct way, I guess the ethical way um, is to ask the question and then think about methods. But a lot of research also first, I want to have this method and what questions can I answer, right? So that's also another challenge. Um, Ya, it, mungkin itu dua challenge yang paling besar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, I'm waiting for uh, more questions. Saya uh, mau tanya uh, lagi, boleh Bu Ira? Silakan, <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Jadi, uh, Ibu Budian, saya juga mau bertanya. Uh, jadi dari S1 Ibu ke S3 itu kan ada uh, evolving ya. 
Jadi awalnya sangat arsitektur, terus yang kesini sangat-sangat interdisiplin saya lihat. Um, bagaimana, uh, kalau di, di Indonesia kan sangat berbeda, Bu. Jadi kalau kita sebagai akademia itu harus linear, seperti itu. Apakah memang kalau aspek linearitas itu uh, tidak terlalu diperlukan jika di Amerika, Ibu? Terima kasih. Um, well, in my experience or the people that I've worked with, uh, a lot of them have a very different training. So one of the professor at Drake, where I work with now, was studied neuroscience. Uh, but now he works with gorilla. <laughs> you know, he works in the environmental science with gorilla, but he was like, background is neuroscience, and he applied what he learned about behavior and science and kind of neurology to um, the field that he loves working now, working with gorillas or primates, right, in the zoo. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think there are people who are trained in specific discipline. Perhaps maybe it depends on the discipline itself, like economy probably is more linear here um, than urban planning. I always think urban planning is very interdisciplinary. So if you are trained in architecture and you still wants to, you know, kind of interested in thinking about buildings, you can go into urban design, um, but like maybe a larger context. Um, and maybe kind of like, you know, planning of the infrastructure and system. Um, so uh, it depends on this discipline again. Um, but there is, I think, um, you know, more flexibility here because I, you know, there was a, a student from Indonesia who, a professor actually from Indonesia who studied, who got a Fulbright scholarship and studied at University of Texas and went into urban planning first, but then, uh, but her background was in uh, industrial science, right? She was really interested in urban planning. Um, so mm -hmm. she was able to do that. You can get a PhD even if you are, you know, in urban planning, if you are industrial engineering. The challenge would be in kind of like, you know, uh, because she was already so uh, so trained in engineering, it was very hard to adjust the mindset to kind of relearn thing. Um, an example is when I tried to take um, Java course <laughs> uh, as a computer science. And so I went at, you know, when I was kind of maybe in my second year or like close to second year, to study Java as part of my GIS course. Um, and I dropped the class because I felt like I was too old to learn this language. Um, so, you know, and that, that doesn't apply to everybody. I'm sure there are people who are very motivated to change, you know, kind of move different disciplines. But um, I think the system here allows you to explore that a little bit more. You, Terima kasih, Budian. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I want to ask question, but uh, yeah, let me read the question in the chat box first. Uh, uh, Budi, can I? Sorry. Sure. Sure. My Go time. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, sebelumnya, makasih kepada Budian. Uh, your presentation is uh, so impressive. Uh, now, uh, let me myself. My name is Ragil. Uh, I am now is uh, environmental engineering. Uh, uh, before uh, I end my high school, uh, is uh, I want to urban planning, but I fall in environmental engineering. But uh, the next, uh, I will uh, uh, melanjutkan lah uh, bagaimana kuliah saya ini mungkin bisa ngarah ke sana karena uh, I'm interested about uh, urban planning. Uh, what uh, my question is, uh, what's your opinion about Indonesian sustainable and should the student uh, learn out of Indonesia or other country? Uh, because uh, I think uh, is other country is uh, have different than and interesting. Um, what thing about it? What do you think about it? Uh, because uh, I just want to uh, melanjutkan ke kuliah aku di luar mungkin cua, tentang uh, urban planning itu. Jadi uh, dengan penyampaian uh, dokter tadi, saya menarik dan 
saya senang karena ada orang mungkin uh, yang melakukan ini uh, dengan senang juga karena menurut saya penyampaian dari yang disampaikan tadi juga uh, bahwa saya lihat uh, Budian senang dengan melakukan uh, hal tersebut gitu. Thank you. Ya, yeah, terima kasih. Um, so sekarang mahasiswa saya uh, banyak konsentrasi di biologi, uh, environmental science, ya. Yeah. Ada juga yang uh, senang ke sustainability and resilience itu salah satu fokus major kita dan mereka semua undergraduate. Um, dan ada beberapa yang tertarik untuk uh, melanjutkan ke urban planning. Um, dan saya encourage sekali karena um, you know punya uh, background di environmental science atau engineering is very valuable uh, now in urban planning. When I started in 2008, um, you know, one of my professor always said there's no money in environmental planning, right? And now look at us, we in the middle of climate change and extreme climate events, everybody's flooding, earthquakes and everything. Now cities are really trying to think about, you know, how do we respond to this uncertain world now? Um, especially, you know, how, and it affects millions of people. Um, there are some who says that climate change is the number one, um, you know, a potential killer of human population, right? Um, so that's really a big challenge and we need everyone. And, um, and I also want to say that uh, engineering can really support, you know, kind of, you know, um, that because you train in analytical thinking and quantitative analysis is a good thing, right? Um, because, you know, but then it's also a good thing when you uh, explore other issues from another perspective um, and not just rely on the numbers, but also think about the political context, the cultural context, the social context. Um, so that can be very valuable. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question, Budian, uh, in the chat box. Uh, Budian, I would like to know, as far as Mrs. Dian's experience, how is the condition of gentrification in Uncle Sam's country when compared to big cities in Indonesia that really don't pay attention to the rights to the city? Um, yeah, so... Um, Gentrification is another wicked problem and I, you know, there are many, many researchers and scholars who have like work a lot in kind of thinking about understanding gentrification and also understanding uh, how gentrification displace people, right? Um, and in the US, you know, it's not a very focused expertise um, that I've been you know, looking into, um, but from what I kind of, you know, just see from read and things like that, um, a lot of, um, there are different approaches to gentrification and a lot of cities um, that are gentrifying results in very high housing prices that, and housing prices here, you, you know, like uh, in Indonesia, you have to pay property bangunan, right, pajak, pajak property. Uh, and so people who, who are, who doesn't have much money, when their property values goes up, which is a good thing, right, but then they can't pay the tax. Uh, so that's a big problem and a big challenge. And that's why they, a lot of them might have to move. Um, but there is kind of this very, you know, big discussions around gentrification that I I probably don't know all the nuances here. Um, you know, I think a lot of communities have mobilized here in the US against gentrifications um, or maybe the gentrification that displaced people. Uh, I, I was part of a housing task committee when I was in Houston and um, you would have people in the community say that, you know, you can't talk about good gentrification or bad gentrification because gentrification always uh, kind of like results in, you know, different ways and affect people differently. So, um, 
you know, there's always that aspect of affordability, making uh, the housing prices not affordable. But also, you know, some cities, you know, a lot of uh, have encouraged gentrification, right? Because the whole idea behind urban planning, or maybe not the whole idea, but one of the ideas behind urban planning is to improve the quality of life through developments, um, through economic development. So building things is good. Uh, you know, having more things that are expensive is often seen as something that is good, right? New buildings is seen as good, uh, replacing older buildings. And in some cases they are, but you know, in a lot of cases, then it kind of beg, uh, present that questions about who can afford to live where uh, in the city. Okay, uh, thank you, Budian. Uh, any more questions? No, if there is no question, uh, I would like to ask the questions. <laughs> yeah, about the community engagement. Uh, so your last uh, project is about the the uh, involvement of Riverbank community in Jakarta and uh, Des Moines. Yeah, uh, so. What is the difference uh, in involving the community in both uh, place uh, in Jakarta and in uh, in the U.S.? Yeah, because I found it's very difficult to like uh, make people to engage in uh, our research, something like that. Um, it's always a challenge, really, to get people engaged. Um, one of the things that I see that where our community engagement have work really well is when we have a community that have strong leaders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, RT yang sangat terlibat, yang sangat dicintai oleh warga gitu kan, uh, atau mungkin uh, sesepuh yang um, tidak pegang posisi tapi peg, uh, punya suara dan bisa mendorong orang untuk aktif gitu kan. Um, so in 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 Des Moines, uh, for my, I just moved to Des Moines, and, you know, almost two years ago, um, and I just started to kind of start thinking about organizations that are active in the community um, that work on um, issues like um, hunger. You know, or it doesn't have to be organizations that work on urban planning, but if they are working with communities to bring food to the table, if they are working to communities to make sure that, you know, um, they can have uh, health care, puskesmas uh, and things like that. So any, any organizations that have a strong position in uh, the community has been our uh, ally has been our partner and that's usually where um, our community outreach is more most successful um, and I also try to approach schools I don't know how the school system is in Indonesia but if you are able to get here they have counselors and they sometimes have a uh, a person who works with parents to make sure that if uh, a child is, you know, behind in class that they can um, work with the parents. So they have parent teacher meetings, uh, conferences. So those are the places where I would look for support. And, um, and it does require a lot of uh, efforts from us as researchers to go into the community. Um, so there are, you know, kind of official public meetings held by the city um, where, you know, city will talk about something and anyone who wants to uh, speak can come. But a lot of those public meetings often happen in work days where parents can come, right? Um, so, um, you know, a lot of time we have to be in the place. We have to be there to kind of talk to people. Um, and then also because we are in the U.S. and like I said, I, one of the neighborhood we work in uh, had at least 30 languages spoken at home. Language barrier is a big thing. So when we did research, we had to translate our questions into Spanish, Arabic, and I want to say Mandarin. Um, so, you know, we 
we are able to identify the major languages spoken at home. Um, so maybe in Indonesia, different, uh, if you're working in community that speak, you know, like uh, different tribal languages, you'll get more response if uh, they see you speak their language. And this is also another thing, uh, whenever I have someone with me who speaks Spanish or who speaks the language of the people that we work with, we get more interest, we get more participation. Um, and then, so in Indonesia, I know that, uh, you know, I think at least from my uh, PI who has worked in Indonesia and has done some of this community engagement practices, maybe uh, local organizations could be helpful, but not always. And sometimes you need to like really go there and it's a lot of investment really. Community engagement is really awesome, really great, but it's also a lot of work and a lot of um, time. And uh, often uh, the residents who we ask questions have been asked by other researchers and they say, oh, nothing is happening. We keep answering questions. We keep, you know, like I think uh, an, an example of this was probably in uh, uh, project housing in Jakarta, right? Residents in housing projects are always being researched. So when they see another research and they, they feel like nothing is happening, why should we answer your question again? Because there's we don't get anything. Um, so what my, you know, my partners and I are very, very, uh, I guess, insistent on is that whenever we think of questions or we do research, we want to make sure that we are bringing something to the community. So for example, for the stream project in uh, East Jakarta and Des Moines that, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be in the form of money, right? Because we don't have money. Um, it can be in the form of maybe an educational program or maybe, uh, you know, building a community garden um, in the neighborhood where people can come and, you know, kind of like take care of the garden themselves uh, or maybe doing something, you know, just something uh, that people see that there's something there. I was very lucky to get the $1 million grant for the, well, you know, we got, not me, <laughs> uh, for building the sidewalks because then the residents really see that, oh, wow, we're getting something from participating. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I saw uh, Nurmala Dewi uh, was raising hand before. Nurmala? No? No? Yeah. Uh, if there is no questions, uh, I think this is the end of uh, uh, the Q&A sessions and, and also the end of the, uh, the lectures. Maybe you would like to uh, make a closing statement. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, closing statement belum disiapkan. Um, terima kasih mm. untuk kesempatannya uh, dan uh, you know sharing pengalaman dalam berbagai macam konteks. Um, uh, apa nanti di share alamat email saya kalau ada yang mau kontak. Iya, yeah. ya yeah, uh, dan ada tadi anak ada yang menanyakan apakah uh, mm. presentasinya bisa di share juga? Uh, ya, yeah, ya yeah, bisa. Keting uh, saya sudah share sama panitia, jadi kurang lebih sama. Um, ya, yeah, dan uh, mohon maaf kalau saya tidak bisa merespon individually. Um, tapi uh, terima kasih untuk perhatiannya, untuk uh, you know uh, duduk di Sabtu pagi <laughs> uh, di weekend um, mendengarkan lecturenya. Oke, okay. ya. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ibu Dian. Terima kasih sekali atas waktunya untuk uh, sharing uh, pengalaman dengan kita semua. Uh, ya, yeah, semoga bermanfaat. Ya, insya Allah, sangat bermanfaat. Insya Allah, kalau buat saya uh, ada apa namanya insight baru, gitu. And uh, I would like to give back the forum to uh, Mbak Iani ya. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thus, we could end the lecture and question and answer session. Let's give a very warm applause for our speaker and also our moderator. You may.
unmute yourself for a moment and let's give a live applause for our speaker and our moderator. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us move to the awarding session to honor the great effort and valuable time provided by our speaker we are more than happy to present the e certificate for dr dian nostikasari thank you very much budian sama sama terima kasih terima kasih bu thank you so uh, to capture the moment we would like to invite all participants and also our speaker, moderator and committees to the virtual group photo. So please can you share your best smiles by turning on the video. Are you ready? Okay, I will start counting. Ready. Five, four, three, two, one. One more time, maybe freestyle. Ready? Three, two, one. That's great. Thank you so much. Now, please allow me to remind all participants to fill in the online attendance through intip.in slash online presence form P2P, or the link could also be found in the chat room. We will send the material and also the Zoom record today to the registered email addresses. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be an information about mekanisme kegiat diseminasi kegiatan. Okay, so I hope everyone has uh, seen the screen. Uh, dalam sesi ini kompetisi diadakan kompetisi diseminasi kegiatan, di mana tujuannya adalah uh, kebermanfaatan kegiatan ini tidak hanya berakhir di hari ini, namun juga bisa di lanjutkan hingga di lain waktu dan di lain kesempatan. Untuk mekanisme diseminasi, peserta akan menerima link berisi rekaman di setiap hari Senin. Kemudian seluruh peserta dapat memposting ulang, meretweet ataupun juga mengirimkan melalui media sosial masing-masing. Kemudian juga bisa mengadakan workshop lokal di antara mahasiswa. Kegiatan ini dapat dilakukan, disosialisasikan lebih dari satu kali karena poin akan bisa diakumulasikan sebanyak-banyaknya. Setiap dokumentasi sosialisasi atau diseminasi dapat dikirimkan melalui Google Form yang tersedia melalui intip.in slash P2P VPL Competition. Syarat dokumentasi harus dapat divalidasi karena nanti proses validasi akan dilakukan oleh panitia. Setelah melakukan semua proses, maka peserta dengan poin tertinggi akan terpilih sebagai pemenang. Di periode periode pengumpulan dokumentasi dimulai sejak 28 September lalu hingga awal tahun depan, yaitu di 15 Januari 2021. Hadiahnya apa? Akan diberikan dua beasiswa penuh bagi peserta bidang Architecture, Urban Planning, and Design untuk mengikuti International Short Program di ITS di tahun depan. Dan hadiah ini hanya bisa untuk diberikan kepada mahasiswa. Harapannya semoga tahun depan pandemi sudah berakhir ya. Sistem penilaian juga dapat dilihat melalui link yang tersedia melalui www.its.ac.id/international/p2pvpl dengan beberapa okay, kriteria dan juga poin terjelaskan di sana. Baik. Terakhir terkait diseminasi kegiatan, great satisfaction comes from sharing with others. Semoga berkenan untuk membagikan kebermanfaatan kegiatan ini kepada rekan-rekan di lingkup universitas kita semua. Baik. So that's all about the uh, mekanisme diseminasi kegiatan, Bapak Ibu. Ladies and gentlemen, time flies so fast that the program almost come to an end. We would like to thank to our speaker and moderator and all participants of virtual public lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, before closing the session, please allow me to share the special announcement to remind the upcoming VPL P2P on 24 October with 
the team free form complex structure delivered by Dr. Anastasia Mulyana and Dr. Negar Kalantar from Texas A&M University. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this meeting. Again, we would like to express our great appreciation for our speaker, moderator, and all participants. We do hope everyone enjoy an insightful and fruitful program. Thank you.